before there was Edward Snowden, there was Annie Michon, a former MI5 whistleblower who has a very similar story to Edward Snowden. Uh, she was working for British intelligence and then went on the run and exposed a lot of important things, including the very fact um, that uh, Br the British government, especially MI6, was hiring al-Qaeda to overthrow um, an elected leader. Uh, also the fact that uh, the, uh, the government knew about the IRA bombings and didn't prevent them, and also the fact that the British government was wiretapping and spying on people uh, illegally as well. Now, Annie, you have uncovered a lot. You went on the run after exposing a lot of important things that the public should have known, but to you, yourself, what is the most important thing that uh, you blew the whistle on? Well, the reason that I and my former partner, David Shaler, quit um, MI5 and decided to go public was what became known as the Gaddafi assassination plot. Now, this was something we saw towards the end of our time in MI5. This was in the mid-1990s. And David, at that point, was the head of the Libyan subsection in MI5. And he was officially briefed by his counterpart in MI6, whose James Bond number was not 007, it was PT-16B. And um, this was a, a plot where MI6 had been approached by a Libyan military intelligence officer who was then codenamed Tunworth, um, and he would ask for help. He basically said, can you provide some money to actually um, help us carry out a, a coup to get rid of Gaddafi, assassinate Gaddafi? And MI6 jumped at this, and they jumped at it for two reasons. One, at that point, they were desperate to get their hands on the two suspects from Libya who um, were wanted on charges of blowing up the Lockerbie plane, the Pan Am 103, uh, which came down over Scotland in 1988. And also, they were very, very keen as well to re-establish relations with the uh, Libyan oil companies, with BP. So they jumped at this whole thing, and they started pushing money towards Tunworth. And he went out and with a bunch of what he called ragtag Islamic extremists, who were Afghan veterans, Al-Qaeda, by any other name, um, they went ahead and tried to carry out this assassination plot. So what happened is uh, Gaddafi was driving back from a People's Congress in Sirte towards Tripoli, and an explosion occurred under one of the cars in his cavalcade in early 1996. And uh, he obviously survived to be assassinated another day in 2011 by the very same CIA and MI6 backed groups, by the way. Um, but innocent people died, both yeah. in the car and in the ensuing security shootout. Yeah. So we couldn't think of anything more heinous at that point because you have a situation where the spies are running rogue. They were not obeying British law to get the prior written permission of their political master, the Foreign Secretary, in order to carry out this operation legally under the terms of the Intelligence, uh, Intelligence uh, Services Act, and it had killed innocent people. Yeah, and it's, it's an extreme story, and just to just bring everything together, the British MI6 government, without approval from higher-ups, decided to kill a political leader of a country because of many interests, one of them corporate interests with British Petroleum, and uh, they did this uh, in an attempt to pretty much uh, overthrow a government. And, and this is just an insane, insane story. And, and, and w I mean, there's other aspects of the story that probably affected you. Uh, obviously, the innocent people that were also killed uh, in, this in this assassination attempt also must have bothered you a lot. But from the process from there, I mean, you knew about everything that was happening. Um, you decided to go on the run. Can you tell us more details about uh, just what happened and what you went through? Because uh, it seems very similar to what Edward Snowden is going through right now. Yes, and when I, I started following the Snowden story, even before I knew who he was, um, it did bring back a lot of memories because we're probably one, you know, we were probably two of the only people in the world yeah. um, who understand what it's like to go on the run preemptively before you blow the whistle on a major intelligence agency. Yeah. So um, we did. We had three days' notice before the newspaper broke the story. We fled the UK, went literally on the run around Europe for a month, and I went back to the UK and was arrested, potentially for a breach of the Official Secrets Act. And David Shaler um, was arrested twice and imprisoned twice wow. for exposing the crimes yeah. of others. First of all, when the French uh, were requested to extradite him to the UK in 1998. So they put him in prison for four months. And once they realized what the actual case was, which is he is a whistleblower, their laws say that whistleblowing is a political action and they do not extradite, so he was released. He then went back to the UK voluntarily in 2000 to stand trial, yeah. um, to face the music, just as they say Edward Snowden should do. And inevitably, there was a rigged trial. Inevitably, he was found guilty. And inevitably, he went back to prison. Yeah. Now, in the UK, under the Official Secrets Act 1989, which is there specifically to stop whistleblowing, you go to prison for two years for each count you break it. 
now consider what the American whistleblowers, the war on whistleblowers that's being waged, are facing. Chelsea Manning, 35 years. Thomas Drake of the NSA was threatened with 35 years. John Kuriaku, CIA, serving three years for exposing the yeah. fact that the CIA tortured people. And people say Edward Snowden should go back. Yes. He needs to stay free. He needs to be able to argue the context of what he has exposed. And why, in why on earth should someone who has taken such a brave step, knowingly risking his you know, 35 years in prison at least, yeah. why on earth should he sacrifice his life? Why on earth are most people around the planet not supporting him, not thanking him? Yeah. Because he's performed such a strong public service exposing the global panopticon. Yeah. Now you expose something that has very uh, important, uh, uh, just creates a very important outline to what's happening right now in Iraq with, uh, with ISIS right now because there's rebels that are funded by the US uh, just like in the Qaddafi case that you exposed where they were supporting al-Qaeda, giving al-Qaeda money to overthrow governments. That situation is repeating itself time and time again Again, and U.S. foreign policy is just seems like a huge contradiction. It's supposed to be a war on terror against Al Qaeda. Same with NATO. Same with the U.K. government. But right now, with ISIS, what's your understanding of everything that's happening in Iraq right now? It's a situation that the U.S. has brought upon itself, and unfortunately, brought down on the heads of the innocent Iraqi people. Um, we have seen time and time again across North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia, the U.S. with its vassal state, the U.K. Um, interfering and trying to manipulate the outcome of oil-rich states. So, what, of course, what we have now in Iraq is a, a sort of blowback, again, um, of the inevitable actions that they took. Plus, of course, you have a situation where they create the very enemies that they say they have to fight. So we've seen that in Afghanistan with the Taliban. We saw it with the um, fight back against the Soviets in the 1980s. We saw it in Libya in the 1990s. We've seen it across the whole region ever since. We've seen it in Syria. What they do is they go in preemptively. They put people on the ground, CIA officers, MI6 officers, special forces from our um, armed forces, in order to provide support and know-how and equipment so that these so-called independent rebels can bring independent democracy to their independent countries. That is a lie. It's not the case. They are going in and subverting these states for long-term economic and strategic goals. That's what they're doing. Yeah. And now, of course, we're seeing the pushback in Iraq because they go out and fund these rebels, these Islamists, whoever might try and get rid of the dictator of the day. Yeah. And then those rebels have the arms, they have the know-how, they have the tech, but they have their own ideology yeah. and they will push back. Yeah. So what we're seeing with ISIS is the inevitable pushback. Saddam Hussein had nothing whatsoever to do with radical Islam. In fact, he had more to fear from radical Islam than most Western countries. And yet he was linked officially in the American mind post 9-11. 67% of the Americans believed he was behind 9-11. Yeah. He was funding Islamic extremist terrorism. It was a load of rubbish. Yes. There is no way. Yes. And yeah. now, ironically, this Islamic extremist terrorism has taken root in Iraq and is uh, causing major strategic problems for the West, but also terrorizing the millions of people who live in Iraq yes. and the poor women. Yes. I mean, let's bear in mind, Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator, but he ran a very secular state. He was a strong man. He kept most things under control. Unless you were a political dissident, you had a fairly good quality of life, particularly the women who could get an education, who could go to university, who become professionals. Now, wherever ISIS goes, they're shoving the women back, covered up, into their homes. They're yeah. not allowed to work. They're not allowed to do anything. Yeah. That is, you know, for half the population of Iraq, it's just appalling. I yeah. mean, the violence is appalling for the whole population of Iraq, but for the women, awful. And it's really important to note that, you know, the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. All these terrorists in Syria, in Libya, and in Iraq now, ISIS, are being funded by Syria. And then, you know, the U.S. and NATO and Western powers backed the Syrian rebels to take over Assad, but they're backing al-Qaeda. They lost. Assad won the election again, and now, you know, the, these rebels have nowhere to go. They go into Iraq, and now they're destroying everything again. It seems like it's just a big continual business market for the military-industrial complex, fooling us, saying that we're fighting the war on terror for freedom. Meanwhile, we're propping up both sides of the circle, which you exposed way before even everything was, was happening as it is now, but now it's happening on an extreme level. So, you know, where do you see this going? And, and, and can you talk about this cycle that's happening right now with U.S. funding both sides, al-Qaeda and supposedly people fighting against it? Can, can, can you describe that? It's the perfect business model, and yeah. the Americans have been very, very clever about this. I would go further back, though. Um, the sort of areas that I now talk about are the, I call it my four wars, the war on drugs, the war on terror, 
the war on the internet and the war on whistleblowers. And they're all interconnected. Now, the war on drugs, for example, from 1960, uh, 1961, the first UN conventions, 1971, Nixon announced it, was the perfect pretext for the US and its vassal states to interfere around the world, particularly Latin America at that time to counter what they called the commie threat, um, particularly across the Middle East and other transit countries. And it was also a perfect excuse for the American government to erode the rights of the American people within their own country, the sneak and peek laws, that sort of thing, yeah. and the racial bias in terms of arresting uh, disproportionate numbers of ethnic minority people and putting them in prison for non-violent drug offences. Now, what we've seen since 9-11 is they have the war on terror, the bright, shiny new toy to do precisely this, but maxed out, supersized. Yeah. They don't need the war on drugs anymore, which is why we're seeing it being eroded. It's, it's a deadly, deadly cycle that's only fooling everybody else, and people are not even paying attention to what's happening around the world, and we're being stuck in this cycle of just endless war, endless military-industrial complex. Not 11 kind of was the kicking point out of everything, and I know, I know you as a whistleblower, you exposed how uh, the IRA, uh, when they were bombing uh, specific places in the UK, uh, MI5 knew about these things and let them happen. Uh, same with Snowden, who recently came out on NBC, and he said, um, the U.S. government had foreknowledge of 9-11 and allowed it to happen. It seems like these terrorist attacks work in the favor of the government. Is there any comments you have regarding 9-11 or false flag terrorism that you think the people out there should know about? I would say that uh, the notion of false flag terrorism and state-sponsored terrorism, which is what the Gaddafi plot was in 1996, is more the rule than the exception. This is a perfectly standard weapon in the arsenal of our spy agencies. Not just the US, not just the UK. Um, do you remember the case of the uh, Russian uh, defector, Alexander Litvinenko? Mm -hmm. He was killed by Polonium-210 in London uh, seven, eight years ago. He was actually a whistleblower who exposed the fact that the, KG, the new version of the KGB had bombed apartment blocks in Moscow in 1999, killing hundreds of people, and that had been blamed on the Chechen rebels, the Islamic rebels in Chechnya. And it was a KGB operation. The, again, another example of a false flag attack in order to engender a pretext to take a country into war. Um, Mossad has done the same thing, the Israeli secret agency, where they bombed their own embassy in London and then blamed Palestinian students who were wrongfully convicted and put in prison for 20 years. Britain carries out dirty tricks. This it just happens everywhere. Yeah. And anyone who thinks it doesn't is naive. Yeah. It's a deadly cycle. It's horrible to see because it affects people. Right now in Iraq, people are being butchered, murdered executed by ISIS, and they're doing it with weapons that we paid for with our tax dollars. But the only thing that could really stop it is whistleblowers like yourself. Annie, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for having the courage for speaking out. Is there anything else you'd like to say, or where, where, where can people also find out more information about you? Uh, we'll have a website which is just anniemachon.ch, which is a Swiss domain name because I don't trust American um, domain names anymore because they can be taken down anywhere around the world under very dubious counterterrorism legislation. So um, if anyone's interested, they can find out more about me there. Um, and also, if you're interested in the war on drugs, I would suggest they go to leap.cc, which is a bunch, it's a global organization of law enforcement professionals who say the war on drugs has failed. And we say this, one of the key reasons, going back to the perfect business cycle, is that on the one hand, the American, um, con uh, the America particularly, started prohibition and enforced it on the rest of the world. Then prohibition leads to the biggest drug uh, trade, a uh, huge drug trade, the biggest crime wave the world has ever seen, uh, which they then have to fight. But one thing that most people don't know is that most of the recognized terrorist groups around the world are funded by the drug trade, particularly in Libya, which has fallen into anarchy and is riddled with drugs. It's one of the biggest transit countries now from Latin America into Europe, which didn't happen in Gaddafi's day. So by... Um, enforcing prohibition by creating this illegal drug trade we're actually funding our terrorist enemies yeah. how better a business cycle can you build yeah. between these different wars and they are interconnected with each other especially with the situation in afghanistan with the growing opium population and the only thing really standing in the way of just exposing all this and stopping all this is really whistleblowers having the courage to stand up so um, it's amazing it's beautiful to see people like yourself who are willing to take that risk and have taken that risk and are willing to help others like Edward Snowden as well. So I thank you so much for everything you're doing because it really is an insane situation that we're dealing with. And the only thing that could really stop it is brave people who are willing to speak out. So don't ever be afraid to use your voice.
Now, there's a lot of conversations, there's a lot of attention in the mainstream media about Israel, a lot of attention with ISIS and Iraq, but there's not a lot of attention with Libya, and there's a lot of things happening right now that not a lot of people know about. Now, Annie, uh, with your experience in Libya, uh, with you having uh, a lot of uh, knowledge of the region, with you whistleblowing specific things about the region, what's happening there and why is it happening? Well, I think the best way to summarize it is that it's a goddamn clusterfuck. We have a situation where an entire country has been destabilized, where whole populations are being um, terrorized, and where we've seen the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, um, which manifests in different competing militias, which are now fighting each other. And in fact, what's going on this week, it's been completely overshadowed with events in Ukraine and events in Syria and events in Gaza. But what's going on this week is a major battle being waged over control of the Tripoli airport, where planes are being bombed on the tarmac and things. Um, and across the whole country, different regions, different militias are going out and being vigilantes and creating mayhem and killing people and raping women and everything. So the whole country has been destabilized since the fall of Gaddafi. And the other unforeseen outcome of this was it's now, as, uh, Libya has now become a major transit route from Latin America through North Africa into Europe for the drug trade. Wow. So under Gaddafi, who was a strong man, Drugs were virtually unheard of in Libya. Now, Libya has become a narco state, and these militias are controlling that trade, which is bad enough. Mm -hmm. We've also seen as well, though, instances of addiction and drug use, and of course the spread of disease, exponentially rise in Libya. So the people are being screwed every which way since this toppling of this evil dictator. Yes, because the US government and uh, also the mainstream media was saying that we're, we have to stop Gaddafi for humanitarian reasons, but look what happened and now because of everything. You also uncovered the plot of the British government trying to assassinate him way before the Americans even got involved, way before all the bombing of the region even happened. But uh, with everything happening right now in, in Libya, what are the key players? And uh, the, the area is very destabilized, but where do you see it going and what role do you see Libya playing in, in all of the Middle East? Uh, I see it unlikely that Libya will have a fulfilling role um, regionally now because they've got so many internal problems. However, what we are seeing is that because of this destabilization, it's become a melting pot for future generations of potential terrorists, jihadis, who might want to push back. Now, this, of course, means that people who went to fight in Libya during the overthrow of Gaddafi are now, uh, the authorities in, the, in Europe, for example, are worried that they might go back to their home countries and wreak more terror. Now, I think it's fairly unlikely because most of them have moved on to Syria, yeah. but they're worried about it, and therefore they use it as an excuse to ram through yet more draconian laws to spy on their own populations. They use it as an excuse to have secret courts in the UK. So you asked who are the main players. One of the key main players from the revolution in, in Libya was a man called Abdel Hakim Belhaj. Now he's very interesting. He's currently the, um, the military leader in Tripoli, um, one of the revolutionary forces, and he was actually arrested um, captured by MI6 and the CIA and extraordinarily rendered back from the Far East to Libya in 2004. He was offered as a gift to Colonel Gaddafi to cement the deal in the desert. And he was then held for six years, he was tortured. And all this came out after the overthrow of Gaddafi when papers emerged from their intelligence agency, proving that MI6 had offered this guy up as um, a gift. Wow. Now he's now trying to sue the UK government, he's trying to sue MI6, he's trying to sue the foreign, foreign, former Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, and many others for this inhuman um, treatment. Because of this case, MI6 and MI5 have persuaded the government to institute something called secret courts, so that evidence does not need to be aired in public. And these secret courts are not just for civil matters like Belhaj, they're now being extended into criminal trials as well terrorist trials. So this does away with 800 years of habeas corpus from Magna Carta onwards, just because of this nebulous threat of terrorism for someone who was actually terrorized by the UK state. Yeah. And then they could definitely hide from accountability from all the wrongdoings that they've been caught throughout years and years of doing. Now it seems like the West, uh, especially the US government, their kind of goal um, is to destabilize the region. That's what they've been doing in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, right now also supporting Israel and Palestine. It seems like the whole area is extremely uh, destabilized. Do you think that's the overall goal of the West? Do you think there's a plan for the Middle East? Or you think do you think that they're just making up things as they're going along? <laughs> I think it's probably a bit of both. I think the original plan was to bring democracy, um, seize power in these countries, and get their hands on the oil wealth. Um, it's also been an excellent excuse for the uh, USA to encircle Iran with uh, many, many military bases and control their last enemy in the Middle East. So I think that's how it started out. However, events have run out of their control. They cannot 
put the genie back in the bottle. We have a situation now where in each of these countries, um, so-called Islamic fundamentalists or terrorists are springing up, and they, they, they've created a situation that's run out of their control. And I think also the US is militarily overstretched. They're going to find it very difficult to um, stamp their, their, their power on the region now. And certainly, if they wanted to get oil money and things like that from places like Libya or Iraq, um, they're not going to get it now because the places are too destabilized. Yeah. They can't make any money out of these countries. It's like order out of chaos, but also it's like they're shooting themselves in the foot. And now we have Iran even fighting ISIS, the, the, the soldiers that were finan financed by Sadar, Saudi Arabia and Qatar uh, to get rid of uh, Assad. So it seems like they're switching sides all the time, and it's, it's a very confusing situation, to say the least. Uh, is there anything else you have to say about the Middle East, the region that's happening right now, or your prediction to what's going to happen in the future uh, in the region? I think um, whatever happens, the US has lost control and, uh, on the, and its grip on that region. There's no doubt about it. So they might have wanted to build up military presence. They might have wanted to control the oil revenues. They might have wanted to box Iran in, um, not least, by the way, to grab its oil and its natural gas reserves, but also to stop it trading those reserves, trading that oil in euros, which is what they've started to do, um, rather than using the dollar, which would, of course, undercut the petrodollar hegemony. So I think the situation now means that it has run out of control. The US can't get it back. And they've also set the seeds for a whole region which can breed a new generation of freedom fighters, terrorists, whatever you want to call them. And it's going to be a massive conf conflagration. I mean, just watching the ease with which ISIS has rolled over Syria, has rolled over Iraq, how are they going to deal with that? Yeah. It's a, it's a very insane situation. Luckily, there's whistleblowers like yourself who are able to blow the whistle on a lot of corruption, a lot of things, and get deep inside geopolitical knowledge that we don't know about and we're not privy to because of your experience, because of your analysis, which I want to thank you so much.